and welcome. This is the Upper Dublin Board of School Directors Operations Committee meeting. It's Thursday, July 20th, 2017. It's precisely 6 p.m. and we're in the Upper Dublin High School Cardinal Room. I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone. Uh, we have uh, one presentation this evening, uh, seven operations uh, facilities uh, items and two transportation items. So let's get started. Um, First, are there any announcements or communications? Not this evening, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And that brings us to our first presentation. Uh, the presentation is by Jamie Doyle. She's the Managing Director of PFM Financial Advisors, and it's concerning a potential um, project at Sandy Run Middle School. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you, and good evening. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. You should each have a document with a blue cover uh, everything in this document is exactly the same as last week. There's no changes other than the date on the cover, so uh, no need to compare. Everything is, is verbatim the same. If you look at page one of my handout, you can see, particularly in that lower right-hand corner, that long-term fixed interest rates uh, have been really moving in our favor here recently. We're pretty much back to where we were at the time of the election not back to the all-time lows that were set in June of 2016, but back to where we were at the time of the election this past November. So that's, that's all good news. On page two, you'll see the district's exist, excuse me, existing debt portfolio. As always, the top half of the page is gross debt service, meaning principal and interest on your various issues. And the bottom half is your local share after you receive state reimbursement uh, to varying degrees on most all of those issues. And we, of course, monitor this page for refunding opportunities all the time, uh, much like we, we uh, conducted in 2016. And 20, column 24 is, is the most important column on this page as we start to discuss a potential new money project. So as you look down column 24, you can see the district's uh, debt portfolio, and I'm, I'm rounding up slightly, is, is level around $10.9 million through and including 2026 fiscal year, and then it starts to drop off. So those drop-offs are important as we think about potential new debt service for a project and how we might structure that new debt service. If you turn to page three, the following analysis will assume, just for discussion's sake, because again, this is just meant to be a, a ballpark price tag as far as debt service and, and millage might be concerned. So the analysis assumes a $70 million project. The actual project size will be determined by, by the committee and ultimately the board. And this analysis also assumes no state reimbursement. So it's meant to be a worst case scenario on which we'll customize and refine and improve as you make decisions. Uh, it, it's also conservative in nature. I, I always, uh, that's my disclaimer, I like to be conservative this early on in the process. In that second section, there's a couple of different approaches to any new money financing. You can do a current funding whereby you wait to receive your construction bids and then you borrow the exact right amount of money. The second type is an advance funding where you borrow all or a portion of the money prior to receiving the construction bids. And the third is a multiple financing uh, where you break the borrowing into pieces and spread those borrowings over several different calendar years. That allows you to take advantage of, of IRS limitations, uh, the magic $10 million per calendar year gets you the lower bank qualified interest rates and the shorter five-year call features. It also allows you to stagger the debt service impact out over more years. Um, and we, of course, take into consideration that when you do multiple financings, you have multiple cost of issuance. Uh, as always, the biggest cost of issuance, the discount or the commission that you pay your underwriter is based on the size of the issue. So from that standpoint, it doesn't matter how many pieces you break it into. The fixed costs of the issue are duplicated each time, but they're uh, way more than offset by the lower interest rates and the staggering of the debt service gradually into your budget. 
in that third section just to talk a little bit about federal tax laws um, because we have to comply with these tax laws in order for you to be allowed to issue tax-exempt debt. Uh, the nice thing about a municipal government or a school district is that you get to borrow at tax-exempt rates and then you get to turn around and invest at taxable rates. Not, not that investment rates are super exciting right now, but uh, that, that can be a benefit. So in order to be able to borrow at a tax-exempt interest rate, you have to uh, meet this three-prong test, and, and reasonable expectations are, are the key words in meeting these tests. So the first one, you have to have reasonable expectations that you can spend 85% of the proceeds within three years, and Bond Council will be very focused on that. He'll want to see a draw schedule that shows that you really have those reasonable expectations. You're not allowed to just go borrow $70 million right now because interest rates are low you know we have to to prove that we can uh, expect to meet that test the second one is the time test whereby you have reasonable expectations that you'll incur within six months of settlement so settlement on each piece if we're talking about uh, a multiple financing plan within six months a, a substantial binding obligation to spend at least five percent doesn't mean you have to spend it just means you have to enter a binding contract which is usually your contract with your architect satisfies that requirement. And then the last one is just that you proceed with due diligence uh, on the project. That last section at the bottom of page three, uh, a lot of this will be repeated, but it, I just wanted to lay out the value of the lower bank qualified interest rates. So again, that's, that's if you're only going to issue 10 million or less per calendar year, you can get this lower bank qualified interest rate. and when I say lower, it can be, as compared to non-bank qualified interest rates, it can be five basis points lower. I've seen it as, as, as wide as a 50 basis point lower rate. So it just depends on market conditions at the time. You get the shorter call feature, five years instead of a seven to 10 year call feature. You, of course, want the shortest possible call feature to give you the greatest flexibility uh, to go out as soon as possible for refunding opportunities, restructuring opportunities. Uh, even if you had a, a windfall of cash and wanted to pay down debt, you would want that shortest possible call feature. The third one, ne less negative arbitrage in the construction fund. Um, that just basically means, and, and I don't mean these numbers to be exact, I'm just going to throw out an example. It means that if you borrow money at 3% and you invest it in your construction fund because you're not going to spend it all on day one, so you get to invest it, but you can only invest it at 1%, you pay 3 you receive one, that difference or, or, or negative 2% is called negative arbitrage. Uh, so, you know, spreading the financings out and getting the lower rate mitigates and, and minimizes that negative arbitrage in the construction fund. Uh, the next one probably is not going to apply to you, but uh, the lower bank qualified interest rate allows you to utilize less capitalized interest. I'm doubtful you're going to need any capitalized interest, but that's just when you take a one-time source of money whether it's your own cash or whether it's bond proceeds, and you use it to phase the new debt service more gradually into your budget. So you're, you're using it to pay interest payments instead of using it for bricks and mortar. And then the last one under BQ considerations is you do have more interest rate risk because you aren't issuing all the money on day one, but we manage that and plan for that um, and... and um, don't view that to be an issue. And, and part of that is you, you don't, you know, over the course of, of the school district's issuing history, you, you don't hit the lowest interest rate every single time you issue debt, but that's part of why we manage your debt portfolio and you do refundings over time, and, you know, that's how you do keep your interest rate as low as possible. And then under non-BQ, you lock in the rates earlier and you have less interest rate risk, but, you know, again, it's, it's the opposite. You have a higher rate, you have a longer call feature, and you have all that debt service hitting your budget kind of on, on day one. Moving on to page four, this is a list of strategies for how to pay for debt service under the constraints of Act One. So these are generic strategies. Um, we will ultimately end up using a combination of these strategies uh, in your financing plan, and, and they're, they're, they start off on the page, you know, most likely to be considered, and as we get to the bottom of the page, they're a lot less likely to be considered in the plan as far as cost effectiveness. 
So number one is uh, fit your millage impact under your allowable index increase and have those gradual increases and seek any exceptions beyond the index if possible. So exceptions, you, you're down to three. You have special ed, you have PEASERS, and you have grandfathered debt, which almost no one qualifies for anymore. So you know there aren't as many exceptions as there initially were under Act 1. Number two has been around forever, but again, it goes back to that draw schedule from your architect that we'll ultimately need as, as you start to make decisions. But we take the monthly estimated construction draw schedule and we're able to estimate how much interest you might earn in the <coughs> construction fund while it's invested. And we use those estimated interest earnings to downsize the amount of debt you ultimately issue. So we haven't done any of that yet. We're, we're just assuming a full 70 million for this exercise. But again, that's one of the ways we'll, we'll start to fine tune and improve upon the numbers. <coughs> Number three, if you have cash or refunding savings that you can contribute toward the project, um, again, that can help to downsize the amount borrowed. There are lots of other considerations with that, uh, including your credit rating and how the rating agency will view all of that. So again, we've not uh, assumed any cash contribution toward the project at this point in time, but certainly that will be an ongoing part of the discussion. Number four, we touched on this a little bit, break the borrowing into smaller pieces, $10 million or less for as many uh, pieces as you can. Obviously your draw schedule is only going to allow uh, so many years that you can get through with a ten million dollar borrowing. There, there usually is one big borrowing in there somewhere, again depending on what your draw schedule ultimately ends up looking like. Number five, indirect cost savings. Um, it may not have a lot of application to you, but you know certainly something to think about. Uh, as you're replacing old inefficient systems with newer, more efficient systems, sometimes there's some indirect cost savings that we can factor into the analysis to offset the cost of the new debt. Number six will probably be pretty important to you. Consider a wraparound payment structure. Uh, that goes back to that column 24 on your debt portfolio page. Uh, that basically means that you start off the new debt with very small principal payments until some of that old debt drops off and you basically promise at the time of, of issuance that when those dollars and those mills are freed up in the future, they automatically transfer over to the new debt. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. The rest of these we're probably not going to need, so I'm going to go through them really quickly. Again, capitalized interest, that's using a one-time source of funds to pay for interest payments up front instead of bricks and mortar. Number eight, a debt restructuring. I, th I think you're really well positioned with your current debt structure. I don't think you're going to need that, but that just is in some situations if you wanted to stretch your old debt out further and in order to make room for the new debt service to layer on top, um, but that gets expensive too because the, the longer you stretch your debt out, the more interest you pay. Number nine, capital appreciation bonds. Those are, are very expensive. They're, they're like the series double E savings bonds you might buy at the bank where you, you give the bank $25 today and at the end of the maturity period, seven or eight or 10 years from now, you get $50 back. You didn't get anything in between. Your, your interest accreted over the maturity time period. So that's why they're very expensive for you to issue as an issuer uh, because you're paying interest on interest on interest that's accreting instead of compounding like it does on all of your current bond issues. And then the last two are just the two different kinds of referendum. Number 10 is, is the Debt Act electoral debt referendum that you successfully executed uh, before where voters vote on a specific project. And number 11 is the Act 1 uh, more recent type of referendum where voters vote on a property tax increase which is not project specific. So just to run through some numbers, and again, I'll just remind you these are meant to be ballpark, very high level. We certainly plan to improve on these. Uh, but you can see on the next page uh, in the red, it's labeled option one. What I did in this option is I assumed a $70 million borrowing. I broke it into three pieces. I assumed in step one, we issued 9,995,000 to settle in the spring of 2018. Again, these are all just assumptions I made. This will all get tailored. And I wanted to show you what this would look like on a 20-year level payment basis. 
so as you look down below in column six, there's your existing uh, debt service that we looked at previously in the handout. So if you did nothing, you'd, you'd still keep paying column six. The new debt service on just this 9,995,000 is in column seven. Again, it's a little conservative this early on in the process. And column eight just sums the two together. Then we'd come back in step two, and I assumed, again, I have no draw schedule to look at yet, but I assumed we did a big non-bank qualified issue in step two of about 50 million, level payment structure. And down below in column nine, you can see what those payments might look like. And column 10 just gives you your cumulative sum. And then finally, step three, 9,995,000 in calendar year 2020, you can see what that debt service looks like down below in column 11. And at the end of the day, if, if you did a $70 million project with this particular structure all in, you'd be at column 12. Now, we would net out column 13. I wanted to just show this in a separate column. Column 13 is your state reimbursement that you're currently receiving on all your old bonds. So you're getting column 13. There's no new state reimbursement in that column for the new project. That's just your existing reimbursement that you're entitled to. But we net that out. And then what you're left with at the end of the day is column 14. So as you look down column 14, you can see that you still have all those same drop-offs that you originally had because these are 20-year level payments. So we've just layered dead on uh, in a level fashion over top of that. In column 15, you can see the gross millage equivalent of this structure for $70 million is about 2.48 mils, of which in column 16, you've done a really great job of planning. And so in column 16, you can see you've already either earmarked or identified 1.17 of those mills in, in your budget. So, you know, no additional tax increases for that 1.17 mills. And then the net in column 17, net millage equivalent. And again, I'm, I'm not calling this a tax increase. I'm just calling it a net millage equivalent because there may be other developments in, in your school district or other things in your budget that are freed up that can go toward this. But the net millage equivalent at the end of the day on this option would be 1.31 mills. And as you look up at the top of column 17, you can see, you know, I've spread this out a little bit, you know, basically over, over three years, a little bit in a fourth year. But the rule is you have to have all the mills phased into your budget no later than one year after the completion of the project. So again, when I see your draw schedule eventually, I'll be able to tailor this a little bit. But that typically gets you at least three years. Sometimes it does get you a fourth year. Just depends. So the things on this page that we're going to compare to option two, which is the same $70 million project, we're going to compare how much interest over the life is estimated to be paid. So in option one, up there in box four, you can see $36 million in interest for this option versus how much additional net millage equivalent do you need to find. So again, in option one, that's 1.31 mils. So if you look at option two, on page six, you can see the same three steps, same sizes, adds up to 70 million. The only difference is this time I used a wraparound structure. And so what that means, for example, down below in column seven, is we start off with smaller payments in column seven until some of your debt drops off in column six, and then we start to fill in with larger payments. Likewise, you can see that as you look down column nine for the $50 million issue. And likewise, when you look down column 11 for the step three, $10 million issue. So, you know, we're taking advantage of those future drop-offs in your debt service. So the trade-off is with a wrap, that's great. You take advantage of those drop-offs. Your net millage equivalent that you need to find yet is only 0 0.23 mils now at the bottom of column 17. And the, the con or the trade-off is the interest. So the interest you pay back over the life is, is about $49.8 million in this example. And that's a function of the slower you amortize your principal and pay off your debt, the higher the interest amount uh, that you pay. 
But I, I would also say that, you know, this many years into Act 1, nine and a half out of ten school districts pick option two because they need the lowest possible upfront millage equivalent because you're also dealing with many, many other things in your regular operating budget that you need to uh, cover with your allowable index increase and, and your exceptions. The last pages of the handout are just the district's most recent credit rating report, which was just as of January 9th of this year, so it is is very, very recent. So I would uh, encourage you to peruse that at your leisure. Uh, you can see toward the bottom of page 8 the credit strengths of the district, the credit challenges, and then the factors that could lead to an upgrade, and at the top of the next page uh, the factors that could lead to a downgrade as well. Um, and again, all the decisions and discussions that we have as you uh, proceed with, with decision making on this project will be taking the rating agency into consideration because that's part of what helps you manage your debt portfolio and get the lowest possible rate is the fact that you do a great job of managing the school district and of, of managing your, your credit rating, which is, is well above average. So I will pause there and entertain any questions that you have. Any questions? Jump. Any first or I have? Okay. So um, I heard this presentation the other night when you were presenting it to the uh, project review committee. And one of the things I found hard to understand, I have asked questions in the interim, but I want to ask them in case maybe everyone else got it but in case anybody else <laughs> had the same issue that I had. So in both option one and two, but you can pick either one because when you explain it, it works the same both ways. The one thing I couldn't figure out was columns 15, 16, and 17 because you don't add across and you don't calculate them the same way. And I wasn't sure exactly what they mean. I mean, I now know what column 16 means, but I think it would be good for either you or Mrs. Bray to explain what those what those are and how you get to the column 17 numbers. Sure. So so we're assuming in the lower left hand corner that one mil equals two million two hundred thousand dollars. So that's what one mil brings in in tax revenue to the district. And so what we're saying in column 15 on a gross basis is to cover this. $70 million of debt, you need about two and a half mils, rounding up slightly, but you have 1.17 of that in place already. So you only need an additional 1.31 mils. And we, and we can equate that to dollars and put it on here if that would make it a little well, bit more clear, because that's a great point. And, and I actually can, if you, if you would like, as far as the column with um, column 16, yeah. um, the 0.66 mil, mils we've talked about for the last two years as being debt fall off, not the proper accounting term, but uh, reduction in debt that we've transferred to our capital projects fund over the last two years of being 1.45, you know, eight, almost 1.46 million. So that's what that 66 mills, 0.66 mills stands for. Um, and then uh, next year, um, we have some growth going on in the school district of Upper Dublin, uh, both residential, um, and also commercial, some things that are happening. So with that good news and with the way our budget is, um, we are planning on setting aside approximately 0.25 mils, uh, about $500,000 or so for um, a, a new money to move ahead um, after next year. And then in two years, the 0.26 mils for the year ending June 30th of 2020, that's the first year that we will not have to make a repayment for um, a substantial real estate um, assessment appeal. Everybody, I'm sure, around the table remembers it uh, as the hub. And um, those payments are still $575,000. But that capacity could obviously would either go back into the budget or can be used for this. And right now, that's what we're planning. So those three items comprise 1.17. And then you subtract that from what is in the previous column um, to yield the necessary millage, tax millage. And the point uh, two three, as we discussed, is approximately 3 quarters of 1% 
of the current mill, which uh, millage amount of 33.0254. And I saw Jamie doing some quick calculations, so I don't know if it was. Well, just to equate it in dollars, the, the two column 17, so, so on option one, if you need another 1.31 mills, that means you need another almost $2.9 million in, in your budget to cover that, and it has to be there each and every year. Um, and the point two three just translates into $506,000 a year to give you a dollar difference. Can, can it, what, else, what I also took me some time to figure out was column 16, uh, that is indicating when that additional millage is available, not, not when it's being used. Correct. Okay, so that, that's different than column 15. If you look at column 15 in option one, that 0.20 uh, increase in millage is the additional going from 10.5 to 11. You're exactly so that it's, right. That's Correct. a point in, in time. Yes, because that, so that's it's when the increase would actually right. occur. Right, so that, that's a little subtlety in, 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 yes. in the two columns. And, and then 17 is... is you know, it's just, it's just the, the, the net, yeah, of, of, of that. So, you know, so we're not actually using the .66 in, in, seven, in the first year. It's just, it's, it's there, we have it. Right. But it's accumulating, it's, it's doubling, you know, it's each, each year. So that, that's a little, that was a little, that took me some time to look at, <laughs> to figure out. But hopefully that helped. So. Uh, another question based on something you said the other night was that uh, maybe that uh, in structuring bond issues, and I guess this is just for school districts or municipalities, you had to have a decreasing payment. Well, so, by, right, but, by state law, you have to have overall either level or declining debt service, meaning you're not allowed to have a big balloon payment out at the end. It doesn't mean every year has to be less than the preceding year? It does not. Okay. It just means you can't have a balloon payment you can't at have the a end. Balloon payment. In okay. fact, you can have increases. There's some minute rules on that, but you know, 10 percent is kind of the max. So option one, it does increase total local effort, or is it just the payment of the new? It's just the payment of the new as that okay. kind of comes online, okay. and that's staggered because of the three-step issue. Okay. All right. So it doesn't matter that in column 14 you go from 10 to 16 million. Right. That's those are the years I'm assuming you you would need increases to cover the new debt service and the rule on that is you have to have it all covered by no later than 1 year after the completion of the project. So the okay. reason why it's really going up in those years is because we're taking down another bond issue. Right. I see that. I just wanted to know if that was okay. Oh, That's yes. Yes. So it's it's not that that has to go to, down every year. And you talked about it, but if you could just summarize for everybody the rationale, you know, the pros and cons of option one versus option two. Sure, sure. So, so the, the pros of option one are really that you pay the least amount of interest, which, you know, is attractive. Um, but, but option one is, is very difficult because you are amortizing principal so quickly that that's why it has such a, a greater net millage equivalent. So, you know, if, if you needed to come up with those net mills, you know, half a mill, half a mill, 0.3 mills, that would be more difficult because you have other things going on in your operating budget that would also need increases, most likely. I, I don't want to speak for Brenda, but <laughs> on average, most school districts do. Uh, so that's really the trade-off. So, so most districts will pick an option two to get the lowest possible upfront millage equivalent knowing that they're going to pay more interest over the life, but also knowing that they're going to manage their debt portfolio, they're going to do refundings to mitigate that, and, you know, they're, they're kind of spreading it out as opposed to having it a, a greater upfront impact on the taxpayers. They're spreading it out over more years and, and affecting the taxpayers that are out in those out years as well as the upfront ones, if that makes sense. It looks like the the payments are much more level instead of having big jumps also in the our total local well, that, effort, that, column 14. That's what a wrap does in column 14. It, it fills in the drop-offs 
so that you know you can have smaller payments up front but when drop-offs start to occur then it fills those drop-offs in so so both are perfectly permissible under state law okay and and actually one of the early questions I think dr. Levinowitz brought up um, when we were talking about if we could put money allocate set aside dedicate whatever you would want to call it um, he pulled out his um, the refunding that we did and he said well we have debt falling off or reduction in our uh, payments based on the refunding but and that's when I indicated that Jamie would be taking all of that into consideration when she did um, the wraparound which is just what you were discussing but but those are the trade-offs it's upfront millage impact versus how much interest you pay over the life I mean those are really the two most important things to compare but in essence it's pay it now, which is a larger tax increase, or pay it later, so to speak, in total through a longer period of time. Another way that I've been thinking about the impact is if you look at column 14, um, in option one, it peaks out at about $16 million a year, and in option two, it pe which is the equivalent, you know, looking at the difference in, in millage, but it, to me, the impact feels different in dollars so 16 million versus 13 six um, per year in the worst cases in you know the worst years in in uh, dollars to go to debt service so um, I, I think that's a to me that feels like a way to frame the trade-off um, in, a, in a way that works for my brain one question the um the amount of 1% tax increase is equal to how many dollars now? Um, approximately 72,000. Or excuse me, 720,000. 720,000. So, so option two is like what? Uh, three quarters of a, uh, right. of a percent? Okay. Exactly. Something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me if you ask anybody that's paying taxes, which one would you want? you want option one or option two um, the the first option you'd probably say I need to raise your taxes about four percent in order to do this project and you know we're not going to pay as much interest but I need to raise your taxes four percent as opposed to option two to do this project I may need to raise your taxes three-quarters of one percent you're going to pay more interest over the long haul but you're going to pay three quarters of a percent if we even raise your taxes to do this project because there's lots of times we absorb a half a million dollars into our budget we may even be able to do that depending on what happens with um, you know new construction what have you going on but but it seems to me that it's much more palatable to anyone that's paying taxes to go with option two as as opposed to one even though we are paying more interest over the long haul I think it's also worth reminding the community, especially that when we talk about these numbers like 4% tax increase or three quarters of a percent tax increase, that's over multiple years. It's not in one year it's going to go up 4%. In this schedule, that 4% is absorbed over three years, um, and the quarter, three quarters of a percent is absorbed over two. Um, and I know that these, you know, all of that is really to be determined, but um, but it's not like it would be a 4% jump in one year. Right. right doing the project versus not doing the project if if not doing it costs nothing which we know it wouldn't do that but it's about a four percent difference in taxes in the long haul if you're doing option one and three quarters of one percent option two it's, it seems like that's could, why most districts do option two could i i ask maybe you were going to talk about this at another time but um to take those two options and explain how that translates to a dollar amount in the if this were all funded with a tax increase this column 17 the net millage equivalent what would that equate to in actual dollar amounts for the typical house and household in Upper Dublin I think Brent, Brenda has it I think I, I had started to look at that, and if we use the average assessment of $195,000, um, the increase would be um, 
relatively modest. I, uh, the first year, let me make sure I'm looking at the right one, it's uh, about $25. And then um, Yes, um, about $25, and the following year it's around $20 uh, would be. And, and, and I was even trying to be a little bit more sophisticated and assuming, you know, calculating it based on the increase in the previous year. So um, around $45, $50, and that's for $195,000. I think as we get into this project more, I probably will come with multiple assessments that are, you know, um, not just the average, but perhaps a little bit higher and try to calculate it and then show people. Uh, I know that there was concern at one of our meetings. Um, there's always the confusion between fair market value, what a house is worth, and then the assessed value. And of course, if you're trying to calculate this on what your fair market value might be, it's uh, a much higher number, double, essentially. Now, I'm sorry, that was only the first one. Um, if we were looking at a uh, 4%, again, going over multiple years, that would be closer um, to probably uh, $300 over those, um, but again, over multiple years to get to, to that particular point. Um, also, though, during those intervening years, we would have um, increases in other costs, so, and which is what Jamie was referring to earlier. So it would make uh, our budgeting a little more difficult. But if we did choose the wrap option, the tax increase for $195,000 of assessed value, which is what, close to three fifty dollars or three twenty-five, dollars I'd be closer to four four hundred, at least in current yeah. days. In, high, current, in the high threes. Yes, high, in the threes high threes in terms of market value oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, of $40, $50, $60. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other questions? And re remember, this is worst case scenario. We're talking about a $70 million project. It may wind up being less than that. It may wind up being less of a borrowing, depending on whether or not we get some interest over the course of the project, or if we apply any dollars that we have in capital reserve to, to the project. But um, worst case scenario, if we went with option two, and if the interest rates stayed um, advantageous to us. We're talking about a, a three-quarter of 1% possible tax increase uh, to fund the project. I do have one question. Based on option two, the wrap, when would the district be in position to borrow again for a modest project if, if it became necessary? I mean, if we were talking about a $10 million project or a $20 million project at some point, five years, seven years, 10 years, when would we be able to do such a, a I can project? take a look at that and get back to you. I hesitate to just throw a date out there at this point, but you're very well positioned. I, you know, I, I, I don't see that being a problem, but I will get back okay. with a more specific answer. Thank you. Good. All right, anything else? I just wanted, before we leave this, although it will also go along with conversation that we'll have um, throughout the evening um, on projects. Um, it's now July 20th, so I can tell you what our um, balances were as of June 30th for our capital projects. That was approximately $5.4 million, um, and debt service didn't change from the previous um, month. That uh, amount, so it's about 2.5. So altogether, we're at 7.8, uh, sitting in other funds, and that doesn't include what we have uh, in our estimate for the general fund, um, which we'll be getting closer to. There's a lot of adjusting entries that need to be done before we estimate what uh, the general fund balance will be as of June 30th. All right, anything else? Jamie, thank you very much thank for the you. presentation. Okay, sure. Uh, while Jamie is here, if anyone uh, would like to ask any questions now, please step to the podium. Jen Kuznets, Fort Washington. Can you just explain on the, um, I guess under like the Upper Dublin's credit, I was just reading it, uh, what um, 
an example of a structural imbalance leading to the decrease in reserves and like liquid liquidity means like what what would a structural imbalance be so so some school districts in the commonwealth are are using and, and it's okay to show using some reserves or fund balance to balance your budget in, in conservative budget practices and then you know that usually doesn't actually get dipped into if you will but there are many districts that are truly operating at, with a structural imbalance meaning they're spending more than the revenues they're bringing in annually and they're making up the difference with with savings but savings don't last forever so that's what the rating agency looks for any kind of structural imbalance whereby the revenues aren't truly supporting the expenditures each and every year okay thank you and uh, in Upper Dublin, that hasn't happened for a number of years. Um, if, we, if you went to go back and look at what our budget indicates, if we, and, and I've said this all many times, uh, when you have to, um, transfers are considered to be in an expenditure for accounting purposes in Pennsylvania. So our expenditures this year, for example, exceed revenues. But part of the expenditures, and I'm using air quotes if you can tell that, um, is 1.5 million or 1.46 million transfer to our capital. So we are not in a structural deficit situation. Stan? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> could um, the school district, um, you know, put any money towards... I'm uh, sorry, I have to state your name. And oh, <laughs> Stan Robsky, Ambler, section of the township. Could um, the school district add monies uh, to the principal um, if they get a windfall? Like, for instance, uh, you know, I don't have a mortgage anymore, and the reason why I don't have a mortgage anymore is that whenever um, I did get a windfall, I put it towards the uh, principal on my mortgage and then cut off the, the years could that could the school district do that? Just say five years from now, they, a big uh, land transfer happened, and we come across a uh, half a million dollars. Could we put that half a million dollars towards the principal, therefore um, shorten the, the period of uh, payments? Sure. Each of the district's outstanding bond issues and any future bond issues that they issue, they have their own individual call date or date by which those bonds are promised to those investors. So, you know. On their issues that were 10 million or less, it's a five-year call date, and if it was more than 10 million, it's a seven to 10-year call date. But you know they have debt from many different years, so they almost always have something that's at the call date. Does um, it have to be all the principal, or could it be just some? No, it can be in part. Okay. Sure. Um, my other question is: is like when when we do borrow the 10 million and then you put it into you reinvest it and just say <clears throat> we get a good interest rate. Um, you says, it says there you're required to spend 85% of the proceeds. Does the interest that you're accumulating or earning when you have that unused amount, is that also under that 85%? Just say we make um, $50,000 in interest off that $10 million that we put into, um, that we reinvest. Does that, just say $50,000, need to be spent also within that 85%? Threshold? No, it, it's principal, and it's it's just reasonable expectation. So you know, it, it's as long as we follow all the rules, it it it's fine. Okay. Um, do you think there will be any state reimbursement, or does it end at that? You know, I mean, you have the funds there for I guess what 15 years or whatever on the existing debt. I mean, is there rules now that there, there will be no... Well, re well re the district you know. will get their reimbursement unless there's some legislative change, you know. So there could be some, and therefore that would lower the... Column, um, column 13 in each of the options is the estimated state reimbursement that they will receive on all the old debt. Yes, but I'm, not... I'm assuming zero on these new projects because there's none available to them at this moment in time, you know, pending the rest of the budget process, but all the preliminary documents extend the moratorium for 1718 and mm -hmm. make it retroactive to July 1 of this year. So we're going to have a little bit more of a conversation right. about this topic uh, in a Shortly. couple of <laughs> items. Okay. My last question is if um, you have three different phases there and, you know, you, for example, you did 10 million and 50 million and 10 million. It doesn't need to be at those amounts right. specifically, right? Um, do all three of those, just say, phases need to be wrap around 
type structure. No, no. So we can do the first eight payment or as standard one. Sure. This is meant to give a range. Right. And the then lowest the, possible and the highest possible in terms of interest paid and in terms of net millage equivalent required. Okay. So we, you know, the first phase could be just a regular, you know, your first. Uh, sure. And, and we'll be back. I mean, even when they decide <laughs> what project they want to do, we'll be back to have these conversations for each step of the process. So yep. it's not like they're making all the decisions up front. We'll be reevaluating based on market conditions and based on how the project's going and based on how everything else in your budget is going. You know, you could change your mind along the way about what you want the next step to look like. Okay. And Thank on, you. And on refundings as well, right? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Thank you very much, Jamie. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks again. <laughs> All right. Uh, can you do the next one? So now, um, first of all, are there um, any minutes from previous meetings? Uh, yes. Uh, the minutes of the June 15th Operations Committee have been shared with the board. If you have any uh, corrections or suggestions, please make those. Uh, let Ms. Evans know, and they will move to be approved at the August 21st legislative meeting. Okay, thank you. And then we go to uh, facilities reports and recommendations. The first is the update on the Sandy Run Middle School Review Committee. Thanks. I gave a slightly longer update on Monday night at the legislative meeting. Um, and as I reported then, at the end of last week's project review committee meeting, we found a near consensus. Um, and the committee found that the existing buildings do not meet our needs and will recommend that the district should build new. The committee will also recommend that the district be as frugal as possible in doing so in order to preserve the capacity to fund projects at other buildings. And the district should formulate a multi-year facilities plan. Mr. Lester already has that effort underway. We'll talk about it a little bit later tonight, and uh, I'm sure it will get a lot of attention at upcoming operations committee meetings. The next step is for a draft of the committee's recommendation to the board to be circulated to the committee and then finalized at the committee's next meeting on August 8th. The remaining questions about what to build, how much to spend, and when to put and when will be put to the board's operations and finance committees uh, over the next several months. Okay, thank you. Any questions? All right, let's move on then. Uh, the next one is the submission of Plan Con Part A slash B for Sandy Run Middle School. How do we proceed with all this? <laughs> um, well, I'll kick off at least a discussion. Uh, Plan Con A and B have been drafted, um, and we will be talking about those at least in theory. Uh, Jamie laid out the fact that uh, Plan Con is somewhat in more, a moratorium uh, position. And Plan Con, by the way, is school constructions and facilities. That uh, Plan Con is uh, abbreviation, acronym, whatever, uh, for all the steps that you have to go through in order to perhaps receive reimbursement. Um, and there's quite a bit about it on the um, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education's website if, if you want to look into it. Um, and have questions, we can talk more about that later. Um, so we have before us Plan Con A, B for Sandy Run Middle School um, at the optimal or at the most expensive um, version and the idea or uh, amount, uh, the idea is to get in line, if you will, because the moratorium it's, it's in flux. We don't really know if there's a, truly a moratorium because it was supposed to end as of June 30th, 2017, um, but uh, uh, or the regular plan con. And then on July 1, we thought that there might be an opportunity. And several other distri districts are filing their documents because plan con or the PDE will go ahead and date stamp them as they come in through the door. However, there is no guarantee that um, they will be considered. And there's also, as Jamie just said, no guarantee that there's going to be any money in the budget to move forward with plan con. So they simply might be approving them only to sit in a file. I, all of you, a few years ago when we were working on the high school, 
Plan Con H, which has to do with reimbursement and is for much further down the line, we sent that off to, to be approved and it's set for a year and three months before we heard anything from PDE because they didn't have the money to fund the additional sections that were coming on or the additional projects across the Commonwealth. So um, what I would like to do tonight is to discuss it and with the idea that we'll move it forward to the August 21st legislative meeting, but then watch very carefully and listen very carefully to what Jamie has to say and to what PASBO, because earlier this week, PASBO, um, earlier, to yesterday, I guess it wasn't, wasn't that much yeah. earlier this week, it's only the 20th, um, they indicated the plan con moratorium has technically expired. And while we know that several school districts have submitted plan con applications to PDE since July 1, we encourage you to proceed with caution. The draft language in the school code, the draft language, let's focus on that. The draft language in the school code bill extends the moratorium to June 30th, 2018 and makes it retroactive to 20, uh, July 1 of 2017. But I cannot emphasize enough that that's draft language regarding the school code and we don't know what's happening with the current budget situation and school code revisions are part of the budget. So and when they say caution, um, please do not assume that if you submit an application now that you will receive reimbursement for your project. So their caution really is don't move forward assuming that there's going to be money coming from the state if you approve the project. Um, they don't want us to make the assumption that revenue would come in. There's, that's, that's what the caution is about. So, so um, quick question, what would be a downside of filing the plan con A and B? Uh, based on what I've been able to learn and, and in conversation and email exchanges with Jamie and um, other people, there really is, there, there doesn't seem to be any harm. The only harm that would come is would be for us to assume we're going to get money at this right. point in time and put it in our budget. Right. I think we have to pr proceed as if we're not getting it. Oh, well, we have not included any money in the yeah. budget for that. Right. So. The the reason, if there is a reason not to do it, it's because as part of Plan Con A and B, and and future submissions as well, but A and B are the first ones, you have to say what you're going to do. Um, and until last week, we hadn't, you know, even the the committee we formed to help us figure out what to do had not had not explicitly said what they were going to recommend. They, right now, we believe we know what they're going to recommend. We went around the table, but it's not written and submitted to the board. The board hasn't accepted their recommendation. So if we were to put in paperwork that says, for Plan Con A and B, that we're going to build a new building and then decide that we're not, um, maybe that's you know not in good faith. But um, I think that it, it seems likely that we are going to uh, at this point, uh, and so I'm, I'm, you know, it seems, while we should plan for not getting the money, it seems reasonable to pursue it in case it becomes available. And the timing is such that the next committee meeting is the 8th of August, and our next legislative meeting is the, the 21st. The 21st. So and our next operations have, isn't until the 24th of August. We may not have the final report from the committee, but we will have had their final say so as a group um, before the next legislative meeting. Can't can so, we communicate? Right, and presumably, so the legis I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, can't we communicate to them? You know, everything I've been reading about the state budget right now and all that's going on, I mean, I heard Joe Torsella talking ad nauseum today about it. The state's in bad shape, and who knows? I mean, I, I can just see this plan con moratorium going on forever. So that said, you don't want to take the chance of missing out in case there is an opportunity. Um, and, and maybe we just communicate that to the, to the committee and say, look, we're, we're not going to make a giant assumption. We're going with what the conversation was about, but we want to not miss any opportunity should there be pie in the sky right. and plan. I mean, we can revise back. it. We can pull it. We, you know, if we, do change our mind, it just means we end up getting further back in line. Right. Um, yeah, we can revise it. Does the plan, plan con um, process add costs to a project? 
I think that there's always been uh, a fair amount of debate about that just because of the, the procedures and the process that you have to go through. But I can also tell you that everyone goes through the pro process, particularly at this size uh, of a project. If, if we were talking about a hundred million, maybe a five hundred thousand dollar project, a lot of uh, because it used to be that you were supposed to file a, a, a form every time you did something significant, and I, th there's been a threshold that has increased through the years with PlanCon telling them you were not going to ask for reimbursement. Um, but obviously, the last five years, well, a lot has changed. So. Uh, I would want to further reflect on that and maybe talk to our engineer, but um, there's, it really follows the process that we would go through. We have to have four bidders. You know, we have to have four primes. Um, there's, there's not much that we wouldn't... PlanCon plan con carefully follows the rules and regulations to construct in a school district environment in Pennsylvania. And if you want to, we can spend some time on the website going through some of those things. There are, there are also requirements on things like, you know, the size of a classroom and other things, but none of those are actually constraining what we would do. So um, I think it's, you know, it's a good question. Would we do something different if we didn't file plan con than if we did? And I think the answer is no, we wouldn't do anything different. PlanCon also has checks and balances such as, you know, the Act 34 hearing. They make sure that everybody knows or its intent is to make sure that the public knows about it because in some areas, in some districts, they, they don't go through the review process like we do in Upper Dublin. So, um, you know, the Act 34 hearing it takes place. That's a requirement of PlanCon. Um, you have to have a lot of board action as we go through each one of the phases. The board has to vote on it. The board has to approve it after the, you know, everything is prepared, first by the engineer, then by the architects, then by you know, the business office in conjunction with Jamie Doyle. So it, it is a clearly defined process. And there's time and money spent in every phase of that process just in staff time, right? Yeah. By, by oh, our yes. staff and our consultants. So there is some cost, but the potential revenue of, you know, ballparking it, um, you know, over a million dollars, less than two million probably. Mm -hmm. um, net reimbursement, if the reimbursement were similar to what we've received in the past, makes it worth trying. Joan? I was really going to ask something along those same lines. I mean, does plant, part of it was going to be what um, Dr. Resnick asked, but part of it was going to be does it Im impose a discipline on the process or do you have to do that based on state law almost the process have to follow the same steps and rules in any case not everything I mean there are, there are parts about plank on I believe that are more um, finite or have you jumping through more hoops if you will than just writing the specifications and going out to bid for the four primes and all of that but it's all, it, it forces you to be very thoughtful of regarding the educational specifications. And if you look what was posted, I, I mean, they go through, as uh, Dr. Mr. Sirota referred to, the number of rooms, the, you know, the, the size, which, again, reflects the educational specification. It, it brings you know, the building piece, the design piece together with what we're talking about financially and what we need for... I said financially first, I should have said educational first, and then what we need to do financially. It also brings in really unattractive things such as, you know, sanitary sewer disposal, uh, structure costs, the architect's estimated fee, the soft costs that we've talked about, which are a substantial portion of the $70 million. So a lot of detail goes into it. It seems the, uh, the upside of, of submitting is just to get us into a place in line and uh, it's a place in line uh, where when you get to the front of the line, they don't have any money to give you right. anyway. You so it may be that uh, the board may feel more comfortable, we'll see, uh, with having a final report from the uh, project review committee uh, prior to uh, actually voting to, to submit the plan con submittals. But we'll have to see how that goes. But, um, but <laughs> whether we submit in... August or in September, when we get to the front of the line, it's like, thanks, but see you later, you know, <laughs> until they 
find some kind of funding source to, to do what they've historically done. Well, uh, Ms. Doyle didn't mention, but one of the things that I had heard earlier and had had um, emails back and forth was that uh, the Commonwealth was going to once again float more bonds. They floated $1.2 billion last fall just to make payments on the already outstanding debt. Uh, there was discussion about that, but with the fact that they are running at a deficit and having their own financial problems, I don't know if that will happen, and I don't even want to think about the Moody's rating for that. Okay, anything else on that? And just to remind everybody, too, the, uh, the size of a reimbursement for us mm -hmm. compared to some other districts in the state oh, yes. and how much mm -hmm. this is just, just, just devastating to some districts in, in Pennsylvania. For us, I think we, we said our reimbursement is anywhere from... 1.8% to 3%. Right. So on. for us, you know, we continue and we move on. But for other districts... Oh, they yeah. can't build. They can't yeah. build. It's, it, it, but I think, to um, as PASBO has recommended, I think we have to, you know, we can proceed with the, pro with the process, but we have to pretend like we aren't getting that money. Oh, exactly. And that's the assumption that we have made. Right. Right. Okay, anything else on this item? So we're gonna, we'll, we'll move it forward and then discuss again right. at the right. legislative? Okay. Okay. Um, next Sorry, is uh, up updating the 2014 what? DEI no, we'll capital to, to the plan. Um, Bob, so I'm want? going to turn that over to Bob and distribute. Okay. Yes, I've been going through the, the 2014 DEI, cap DEI capital uh, improvement plan, and the first step I've been doing is marking down what we have completed. Uh, I've indicated on the papers that uh, Brenda is handing out. Uh, which projects uh, have been completed, and also which projects are in progress of being completed. Uh, a lot of the work that we are doing uh, as part of this project, as part of this list, is handled by in-house staff, uh, or it's incorporated into other projects, or we just do small portions of it as we go along. Uh, for example, one of the, uh, you see in most of the buildings on the Capitol are repainting the buildings. Well, we're not repainting picking one building and completely repainting it, each year we take the worst sections of that building and are repainting the worst sections of that building over the summer months. Uh, we are, this is a list, too, that we will have posted. It was just uh, really in a, a rough form right now. Uh, I've been working on it on a daily basis, uh, including up through this afternoon. We're uh, just coming with updates onto this. Um, some of the items, as you go through, that have been completed, uh, security entrances at all the schools was one of the top priorities uh, that has been completed. Uh, another uh, common theme uh, for all the buildings, uh, we replace fire alarm systems. Uh, those fire alarm systems are, are new. Uh, some generators and transfer switches, uh, that uh, was taken care of at Fort Washington last year and is in progress. Uh, this year as part of the electrical service upgrades uh, uh, at Thomas Fitzwater, and I'll report later on on that. Uh, another common item that we've seen in all the schools, uh, which is very nice uh, that we're taking care of this year, is one a large project is replacing the phone systems. Uh, back when this report was done, back when we were still using mostly the standard phone systems, we had to switch uh, phone switch at each school, routing the phone calls, tying back to a main server. It's all being done now by voice over IP systems at a much lower expense. Uh, the equipment's cheaper, the phones are cheaper. So, uh, for example, Fort Washington, I think it was around $270,000 uh, to replace a phone system. We're doing the entire school district for $108,000, uh, plus some other uh, minor expenses that we're going to have which also includes upgrades to paging systems. Uh, so a lot of our paging systems now are through the phones. So the capital list where we did have uh, mentioned replacing PA systems will be included as part of our phone system. Um, a lot of the other items that have been completed, uh, I would like to put a number to, I'm just having a little difficulty finding that information because we have done a lot of it has been completed by maintenance staff. Uh, it's just been lumped into the op our operations budget uh, during the year. Uh, for example, Fort Washington and Jarrett Town's uh, security entrances were done in small portions by, some was done by our staff, others were done by small just purchase orders uh, as part of, you know, we would brought somebody in to hang the doors, we did the carpentry work, uh, and then we just had another outside firm come in and put in the locks and card readers. So it was done in smaller portions 
competitive. So it was not bid out. So the record's a little more difficult uh, to dig out right now. Do you want me to get through some of the other projects or just have questions? Well, right now, first of all, I just want to um, get some clarity on. Uh, we did the, uh, the DEI capital improvement plan. That was basically a draft, um, basically a draft feasibility study. Is that, is that what that was at the time? Um, and I'm wondering if then this uh, document we're looking at would feed into a, an updated district-wide feasibility study. Yes. I mean, yes. I, mean okay. I just wanted to, yeah, yes, I think you've described it perfectly. It's what we start, had started with on May of 2014. Right. And so Bob's been going through it, and we knew that we were biting off small pieces, although the boilers at Fort Washington and the work we've been doing at Thomas Fitz is certainly more than that. And so the idea is to update, uh, and Bob's been working with that document and giving a, um, Dewey Engineering, some updates on that as well. Okay. And the other thing I just wanted to mention, Bob, is that um, I'm quite impressed that, you know, like, what, a year, year and a half, whatever it's been, uh, 14 you know, the world kind of changed uh, <laughs> here, here as far as maintenance in, in Upper Dublin. And uh, with your leadership and working with your crews, um, you've been able to accomplish a lot of things that maybe in the past would have been subbed out. And uh, so it's really... Um, saving the district quite a bit of money and things are getting done more quickly so uh, hats off to you and to all of your crews for doing that work and and uh, and really putting a dent into this list I appreciate thank you it. question um, how would you recommend we go and put our priority numbers in because I think we do have some differentials with DEI's prioritizations. Absolutely, and that's, uh, that's something that I've been uh, working on, trying to come up with a way to do this. Uh, of course, when you look at anything life safety uh, first, if it's a life safety improvement, ADA improvements, uh, taking top priorities. Uh, and I also want to look at some of these projects. Uh, are there ways to bite them off in smaller portions to incorporate them quicker into a plan? Um, you know, do we just do... a replacements on the sections of buildings versus an entire building so we can do multiple projects at each building and somebody get a little somebody getting mm -hmm. projects done in each building every year or does one building get all the money one year for a major project so th these are all things that we want to look into but I really would like to uh, look at anything that would be safety related would be a high priority uh, but also uh, something as Jamie said if, if there are projects here that are going to be saving us money on our operational costs maybe that moves on but higher on the list um, anything that's at a, a near failure uh, rate uh, definitely be high on the list as well because our I do have some looking forward to what I would like to present in a three to five year plan one year plan even uh, or somewhat failure related where we can see equipment isn't going to last uh, too much longer right because it's hard to tell I mean when you see something like at Jarrettown replacing the kitchen equipment that's a pretty big chunk I, I, I'm not sure how urgent that is or isn't so that's the kind of correct thing and this is uh, I have the kitchen equipment I need to work with uh, Kristen Daly on it I was going to just, somebody else will have to weigh in on the kitchen equipment too okay. but there's also another source of money and we are starting to see some fund balance accumulate there so it's another source of funds but oh. I see but like for instance I think Dewey has it as a fairly high priority but maybe that was just from their point of view from our point of view once Kristen has a look at it with you, whatever, it could change. Yes, I, I don't want to speak for the condition of her equipment. No, no, right. I just, yeah. Yeah, and there's small projects. There's some um, removing incinerators in the building you know, Do we had listed as a higher priority than I would give it. All that's doing, it's not affecting operations. It would just buy you maybe 20 square foot of storage space. Uh, so is right. it really worth a high priority spending money just to, gain extra space where it wouldn't affect anything operationally or educationally. Okay, any other questions yeah. about um, this? Two, two things. Regarding priority, you mentioned things like life safety and, and other things driving uh, priorities up. Of course, ed anything that might improve educational outcomes um, is not one of the things you mentioned, but should yes. potentially drive the priority up. Um, so I, I gather that this effort is, you know, is the beginning of the long-term financial 
uh, sorry, long-term <laughs> facilities plan that we were discussing in the Sandy Run Project Review Committee. Um, I don't want to pin you down, but when do we think, and I know that kind of work is never actually done, there's no such thing as done for one of those plans, but when is, when is it, you know, in, the, in its final structure and ready to show? I think we have, we'd have a good shot. Uh, we're talking about September. Oh, it would be it would be aggressive, but I believe we could do that. Yeah. Cool. And, and both operations and um, finance that night are, are are a week earlier than usual. So I gulp when we say that. <laughs> I was going to say, are you not taking vacation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, you have to jump off, so to speak. And we all know that whenever you do a long term plan. It's going to change oh, yeah. almost yeah. immediately. Uh, and when we started doing the projections a few years ago on the finances, that was a big step and a little bit scary too. And Bob's being a great sport, that's you know less than two months until we try to have something out there. And it, and it will evolve between now and next spring when it's time to do the summer work for 2018. So, Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. But it's basically a five-year plan that we'll, is probably all the more we'll get to by September. September, not right. the 10 and the 15. Right. right. Well, that's a, that's a start. Have that's a start. Expectations in line. And that's the timing we really should have any expectations what we want to do for next year. Uh, in case we do need to bring on consultants to put bid specifications, uh, that's the time frame we need to be working on them for the best pricing. Uh, we should be bidding the end of December, early January on these projects before contractors so start getting loaded with projects. Right. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, anything else on this item? All right, I want to shift gears a little bit and, and jump down um, to item F, uh, purchase of PEOs, POE P -O -E yeah. switches to accommodate phone system installation. Uh, yes, uh, this was from Phil Vinogrov, who's away on vacation. I've been working with him uh, regarding this. Our new phone system, uh, the, the voice over IP phone system, uh, there's two ways to power the telephones. One would be plug the telephone into a receptacle with an adapter, or it could get power over the Ethernet lines from the switch. Uh, we're recommending that we use the, uh, the power over the Ethernet. Uh, many reasons. One, it, it'll allow us to move the phone around. We don't have to have a designated location for the phone. Uh, the phones are working on our, we'll be working on the current data line, so if we don't need to be near a receptacle, uh, it makes it quite a bit easier to, and flexibility to move the room around. Uh, but the big item is for, for life safety. Uh, all of our IDF rooms are backed up by our generators. Uh, so if we had a power failure, uh, if the receptacle wasn't powered by the generator, which 99% of our receptacles are not backed up by the generator, mm -hmm. uh, the phone will not work during a power outage. Uh, if we use the Ethernet switches, which are backed up by our generators, our phone system will stay up and running during all the conditions as long as we still have internet. Okay, good. And so this is the uh, item that would be $14,684? Yes, yes. Okay. Phil did research. Uh, he looked at uh, several vendors, I believe CoStar's vendors, and uh, he actually found the best pricing from a right. separate vendor. And I, I, if I'm, I'm going to say in very rough terms, I think we were talking originally that the phone system was going to cost a half a million dollars, and you guys have it so it's a hundred and some thousand dollars. So yes. Phil did a great job working with uh, another IU who has Blast. a CoStar, Blast IU, has a contract, uh, CoStar's contract with the state. Uh, they did this exact upgraded Springfield last, uh, probably over the last few weeks, and it was a quick turnaround. I believe they only needed a week to install the phones and, and switch the system over, and it's a fantastic savings. Yeah, so, I mean, to spend $14,000 to make sure that this right. system that you've, you've cut cost of it by you know a quarter I mean three quarters or something like that fourteen thousand dollars to make it very flexible I, I think that that's good money spent um, any comments or questions on this item it was a lot of fun to watch Phil and Bob try to decide whose budget the fifteen thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> all comes out of the same place eventually <laughs> oh no I don't I don't tell them that <laughs> It is one of those places, though, where technology increasingly, technology, you know, it used to be the computer on the desk, and increasingly it is infrastructure. It is part of the plumbing that the district runs on, and, um, and it, it does require, a, you know, an evolving thought process. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'll add that when we first started talking about phone systems, I did mention that one of the big drivers for how you end up designing these kinds of things is 911. Um, and so, uh, I, and I did have a lot of conversations with Phil about this um, as this was moving forward. But this is this is an example where we are spending a little bit more money. Um, I mean, like you say, a lot less than we originally thought, but um, more than you know, plugging it into it comes with a brick you can plug into the wall, right? So you know, it's cheaper to to do that. But this is the smart move um, in terms of the the right way to do it. 911 features for this phone system are greatly improved what we have now. Uh, right now, anybody in any room could pick up a phone, dial 911, and it just comes back as the school address. Uh, so they throw open the window and yell out. The and phone. you don't know uh, it's happened before in our elevators, or somebody will hit 911 in the elevators, and uh, nobody where it came from, and it was a search to walk around and find who dialed and when. Um, it was so the address came back the new phone system has the capacity where each phone will be individually programmed so they will know the exact location where the call came from yeah. and it's worth pointing out that that capability requires because you can basically take the phone and move it wherever you want and it will have its phone number um, you have to reprogram it to, to send the right location if you just take the phone and plug it in somewhere else it will continue to report whatever location it had before so um, you know, that requires new procedures and new work and all of this stuff does. And so as, as Art just whispered in my ear, um, we do need to make sure this happens. You know, there are a lot of new procedures. It's not just new phones and it works the same way it did before. We have to have this all done before the school year starts. Um, or we would like to have it all done before the school year starts in order to minimize disruption. Because there is disruption whenever you change technologies like this. So we're, we're still thinking that's, that's doable? Well, the, the purchase order has been cut for the phone system. We're going to discuss funding sources in a little bit, but uh, so that we weren't holding it up, that o yeah. the order's gone out. All right. Good. That's great. That was important to us to make sure mm -hmm. that, if, if at all possible, that that gets done before school starts. Yes. Because there seems like there's always something that at the beginning of a school year, and if you can just have a really clean start, um, and particularly if you can plan around things that you know could potentially be a problem, uh, you're better off. So I'm, I'm glad that we're able to, to uh, have a good shot at that. Um, okay, anything else on that item? We'll jump down to the funding source for the new uh, uh, voice over IP phone system. Um, as, as I indicated, we went ahead and cut the uh, purchase order uh, out of the general fund. Um, and actually, uh, Bob lost the... the contest as to where it was going to be charged because PD has come out and told us very distinctly, although we've talked about technology being important for phone systems, um, it will be charged to operations. So right now, um, even though Phil came up with the idea, the, the budget is being paid for out of um, operations, Bob's area. And I at least want to have the conversation tonight um, that it could, this could come out of capital very easily out of capital projects. Um, which we, Bob probably wants to do it right now so to keep his budget whole because it isn't part of the roadmap that we set out for 1718. Um, I'm fine with that, but I'm also fine with just uh, waiting and see how the year progresses and what else can uh, may need to be done out of operations and then come back to you and say, could we please uh, transfer the money out of and, and pay for it or reimburse the general fund for that at that point in time, if that would suit the operations committee. Does this, do any components of this phone system have ongoing like licensing costs or that sort of thing, or is this really a, just a purchase? That I do not know. I, uh, Phil would be able to answer that better. Uh, yeah, I agree with Bob. Not to my knowledge. And we've had, I don't want to say, I haven't been in, uh, involved extensively, but certainly Phil and I have talked about it, and we have talked about it, uh, the three of us. I'm not aware of anything, Mark, but we can ask. Yeah. Phil would have been here except for right. vacation. My my instinct is where we can capitalize this, uh, that is where we can pay for it out of capital projects, we should. But if there are ongoing costs, we should be cognizant of those. And obviously those can't, be, can't come out of capital projects. You're cor absolutely correct. Uh, the life of the system, would that in any way have an impact on whether or not it should be capitalized or, or uh, out of operations? Um, it would. Um, but certainly we would. 
I always like to say, you know, the assets that we're going to spend money on out of capital would last, you know, 15, 20 years. This probably won't, but it's certainly going to last more than the baseline of five years, probably 10 years. I mean, when was the last time we bought a new phone system? Uh, I've been doing this a long time and have not bought that many throughout the years. I was here, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 haven't, haven't we done this with school buses, too? Uh, well, school buses, though, they're $100,000 right. a piece, and you're going right. to get... You know, they definitely last 10 or 12 years. There's no argument. But Right, but we've had them where we could take them, we could capitalize them or Correct. take them out of the general, general fund. Yeah. It's, it's the same situation. Yeah. I think what it comes down to for me is if, um, if we say let's wait, that means that you're having to adjust your, your planning through the year by, you know, potentially not having this $100,000. And if that's, if that's an issue for you, then I would say let's, let's capitalize it so that you can do your job appropriately and, you know, get things done that you know need done. Um, but so, we talk a lot. So. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, so I would support capitalizing it okay. as long as, um, you know, if, if it's needed. And, and I wouldn't wait it, because I think that sticks you in, in the middle of like, okay, now what am I going to be able to really get done this year? You know? okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I do want to caution, though. So I, I certainly this should last more than five years. But this is now, you know, this isn't like old phone systems. These are now computers. Um, there's software that will be updated, uh, and components can be. You know, you might not update the desk sets, but not update the switches. And you know, it, true. There, it's not you buy a phone system and then ten years later you buy a phone system. There, this is, it's now computers that sit on the desktop, and networks with components that are pieces of that network. Um, I still think it's reasonable to capitalize it, but I think thinking of it like we thought of phone systems in the past is dangerous. Agreed. So shall I bring it back for discussion next month after I've had a chance to talk with Phil, or are we comfortable with moving it forward as a motion? Probably under finance, actually. Um, um, yeah, I'm comfortable moving it. In. I mean, Although um, I do agree that... Vanessa, it, oh, Michael. I'm sorry. I have no problem capitalizing it. Sorry about that. Although I do agree because even... I remember when computers were capitalized all over the world and in, in and general... Can, yes. Right, and then, oops, now we're expensing them um, because they're, they turn Useful over life. so quickly. The phones are going to be like computers. Yeah. Um, but I, if it's still permissible, I have no problem with that. Okay. All right, then we'll move that forward for uh, legislative... Thank you. Okay. All right. And now we'll go back to uh, item D, summer projects update. Yes, uh, summer projects, the largest project that we're taking on this summer was the electrical upgrade to Thomas Fitzwater. Uh, that project, uh, extremely happy with the performance of the contractor uh, through this point. Uh, they are, I believe, well ahead on their schedule. Uh, if anything, they'll be waiting for PICO to meet their, their timelines uh, yeah. for upgrades. Uh, so far, all the underground work has been completed. The new conduits have been pulled into the building. The pads have been set for the transformer. Uh, all the panels, the electric panels, uh, have been uh, are hanging in where they are supposed to be. They're connected by conduits. They just need to pull the wire to those. One of the things that we're happy about, uh, we weren't sure about this project, is whether or not uh, there was, there's two conduits coming from Pico. Uh, years ago, I don't know when this occurred, there was a failure in one of the wires inside the conduits. They used the spare conduit to pull the new wires to the building. Uh, going on this project, we didn't know if they would be able to get the wires out of the old conduit. If they didn't, we would have to retrench uh, from the telephone poles around the back of the building, which uh, we were nervous about. Fortunately, they were able, they were almost about to give up, and they gave it one last try, and they had a pop, and they were able to get the old conduits out of the, uh, the old wiring out of the conduit. So we have a spare conduit underground uh, that we have for the project, which is going to help out. Uh, it wasn't, the cost was uh, made up through unit pricing, so if we, they did arrive at that, it would have been controlled under unit pricing, so right now it's not a savings on the project. It's just an expense, uh, change order expense that we don't need to address. Uh, the shutdown from Pico is going to be on August 2nd. 
uh, PICO is actually going to cut the power of the building because they need to remove the lines from their primary mm -hmm. uh, system. And that will give the contractor the opportunity to work on the, the new electric lines to the building. Uh, we will not lose operations in the building. They are backing the gener building up by a generator. They're bringing a separate generator in that will run the building. Uh, and PICO's timeline to turn the electric back on is uh, August 18th. I'm sorry, August 16th. And the contractor expects uh, to be finished completely by August 18th. So they only need two additional days once PICO turns the power back on. Good, good. Uh, and you have uh, a little bit of room to spare. Just yes. A little yes. bit. Uh, the one of the the items I would ask to consider on this, uh, there's been some extensive concrete work in the rear of the building uh, where they've had to cut sections of the slab out. Um, and we didn't want to repair any damaged concrete. We do have damaged concrete behind the building. We didn't want to repair it in the past because we knew if there was a possibility that they were going to have to dig up the old conduit because they couldn't pull the wire through, mm -hmm. that this sidewalk was going to be in a direct path. Uh, but now that they are not going to touch it, uh, we would have the opportunity to have them provide a, a change order to us to replace the existing sidewalk that is damaged. Uh, they, are rep they are putting about 40 foot of sidewalk in as part of the project. Uh, that would re leave remaining 135 feet of sidewalk uh, that has not been replaced. And I think it's one of the only sections of sidewalk around the building that have not been replaced. It is cracked. Uh, it has a slope to it. It has sunk in, in many places. It, it is a trip hazard and will need to be addressed. Uh, they didn't have time to give me a, a formal quote before this, but we're looking in a range of somewhere around $15,000. If that's something we consider, we can pursue a, uh, getting a formal quote from them for a change order. Okay. Um, I think if, if you are comfortable with the, uh, the estimate that they give you, if it, it matches with other projects that have been done. Um, I think it's important to have a good clean project, especially if you have tripping hazards and things like that. Um, I think that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, so I would support uh, you in, in making sure we, we button up this project well. Um, Vanessa, yeah, you, no. agree with that? You, you said you would be getting a change order, right? Yes, they would okay. put in a, a formal change yeah, order to I, us. I, yeah. I think that's I imagine this work would need to take place prior to our next uh, legislative. Um, so yes. unless there's uh, disagreement amongst uh, board members here, uh, I would say proceed. Okay. We'll keep you informed. The other major project we have going on with contractors has been the asbestos abatement of floor tiles. Uh, right now, Thomas Fitzwater is complete and Jared Towner are both completed. Uh, everything has been cleaned, uh, retested for make sure there are no uh, particles left over from, from the remediation. Uh, that's good. They will be starting at Fort Washington tomorrow. And Fort Washington, we expect to take two to three days. And after that, our floor company will be coming in and putting down new floor tile. Okay, good. Good. Uh, any other projects we don't? We uh, most other projects are small. Uh, we're proceeding, moving along with them. They're being handled by in-house uh, personnel, some purchases from other, uh, you know, from vendors for the supplies and equipment. Uh, good, good. All right, anything else uh, on that item? And then let's move to uh, repairs and maintenance of the Upper Dublin High School pool. Okay, everybody's aware we started using a uh, an outside contractor just help us oversee what's going on and that's been going well I feel very confident of how our chemicals uh, how we've been using our chemicals I believe we've cut down the amount of chemical uh, that we have needed and what we are putting into the pool uh, they've addressed some issues that we had with filter changes frequency cleaning and at a significant uh, savings in, uh, in cleaning materials uh, to us on our pool filter and so it's working well uh, we have found some deficiencies that need to be corrected uh, I do have uh, quotes. Most are minor. Uh, we have, uh, we're looking at a uh, solenoid valve for the automatic pool fill, which would be $1,100. $1, um, one of the starting platforms, uh, the anchor that's in the concrete, uh, has warped. Uh, and they can't remove the step once it's installed. Uh, so to put a new core in for the starting platform would be $1,050. Uh, we're also going to be looking at making some changes to the heating lines. Uh, as part of the, we brought our consultant in to look at the uh, the pool heater 
uh, what we thought is not getting the proper flow through it. So we're going to make some changes to the piping out of pump uh, to that to, to force more water through the pool heater. Uh, one of the quotes that we have, it was just, it was minor, only $500 uh, to add additional uh, saddles to the piping. So if we do have a pool heater problem, again, it will have a potential of uh, bringing something in to connect to provide temporary heating or install a small heater alongside. A saddle is just another tap onto the piping uh, <laughs> that we can quickly connect to. Uh, it would just be a T in the pipe with some valves on it that we can right. connect another heater into it. Okay. Uh, some of the larger items that we're looking at, we've developed a, a leak in the pool pump itself on the seal. Uh, it developed about a week ago. Uh, we discovered that uh, that does need the pump needs to be pulled to have that uh, uh, to pull out of the, the pit mm -hmm. to have that seal replaced. Uh, we do have a quote thirty eight hundred dollars to replace the seal on the pump. Uh, fortunately, we do have a scheduled shutdown on the pool where there is no. Um, there is nothing uh, occurring. All of this was blocked anyway for, for activities. Uh, that starts the July 31st. So uh, we've been in contact with the company. They've been out, uh, Kufum Motors, who we've used in the past. They've come out. They looked at the pump, the motor. Uh, they have the parts in stock. And they know to be here the first day of our shutdown to remove that, that motor and take it back to their shop and get it quickly back to us, which um, hopefully would be less than a week. To make that repair. How long uh, is your scheduled shutdown? Uh, the scheduled shutdown is for two weeks. Okay. Uh, which brings up some other items that we're looking at, and these are all rough prices that we want to look at for the future. Um, don't have any recommendations on this yet, but uh, if we were to have developed a problem with the pool pump uh, and where it would have to be pulled out during a season, and we would be looking at significant downtime. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at the possibility of a spare motor uh, with the pump impeller already attached to it. So that way, if something were to fail, we can pull the one, put the spare in, while the other one's out being repaired. Because depending on what needs to be repaired, it could be several weeks uh, to get the parts and have the, the work completed by a shop. Uh, so we are looking at those. And depending on what options, we're seeing prices right now, uh, $8,300. Uh, Ninety-eight hundred dollars, uh, depending which option we go with, and that's only from one vendor. Of course, we're gonna we're gonna look around at other vendors, but we understand we'll ballpark what we would be looking for for uh, to keep a spare inventory list on the pool. Yeah, and it, it seems as though uh, that's that's a more or less high probability item. Yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we don't need uh, experience to teach us uh, <laughs> again um, that if if we shut down uh, in the middle of the school. Uh, year or particularly in the middle of the swimming season um, it's like the cost is no, almost no object to get back up running so um, yeah, if it's if it's something that is a uh, high potential for uh, for a breakdown um, and you can find a way to, to get back up and running quickly it's, it's worth to have some spares on hand which we talked about when we we're in the midst of uh, our catastrophe so I, I take I, it I that, that. U-Haul doesn't rent these things. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the last item uh, that we have been discussing with the pool and, and our um, uh, deep run aquatics is the, the drive that actually sp controls the speed of the pump has been problematic, uh, and it's been identified as an obsolete piece of equipment by the manufacturer. Uh, so we would like in the future to upgrade the drive Right now, the first price we had on it was $9,900 for a drive. Uh, not confident on that price, so it's something I <clears throat> would like to shop around a little more, but it's giving us a ballpark range of what we expect. So that, that pump has a variable speed drive on it? It does have a variable speed drive. Uh, there was some considerations. We just changed it to a different starter uh, to do away with the variable speed drive, but we found out the type of filter system that we have, it should be running at a slower speed uh, as you start the pull up uh, each morning, it should go through a startup process, even though it's, we run it 24 seven, but once a day, we need to shut it down, uh, perform a maintenance check on the filter and restart it. When it goes through the restart system, it goes through a coding system for the filter and that should be performed at a lower speed. Okay, uh, so it's not a full variable speed really, it's more like a soft start. It's, it's more like a soft start, but uh, the requirements of the filter are more that we would need it as a two speed okay. starter. All right. Okay. All right, so uh, you're saying that uh, there's potential you need to replace that drive then? That's correct. 
Okay. Do you have any ideas of prices on that? Uh, that's what we're looking at. Uh, the first price we had in was 9900 I'd like to see that a little bit lower, so I'm going to yeah. shop that a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else on the pool? No, that was... Any more questions from anyone? All right. That, that. Uh, the funding sewers. Okay. I think we've covered all the uh, facilities items, so now let's swing over to transportation. Uh, proposal for transportation consulting services. Before we even hit that, I just want to um, let everyone know that Bob Stover, uh, former transportation director, retired six years, uh, is back in the saddle, using that word again, um, <laughs> in transportation, uh, helping work with our um, uh, software and putting the routes together. Um, he just started on Tuesday after approval on Monday night, uh, and we've already had one conversation. There's some training going on with um, the software, and um, of course we have not only new software, but we have new board policy that must be followed, uh, as well as looking at a new um, um, hazardous route as deemed by um, PennDOT. Uh, but Mr. Stover's familiar with that, and um, when I told him that yesterday, or we, we were, uh, excuse me, and that was on Tuesday, um, he already had ideas immediately of how to address that in conjunction with using our trapeze. And Neil Evans is also down at the Transportation Center. Uh, we are finishing up with uh, cleaning uh, buses and getting that work done. Um, and he's also been a big help with ESY. We've had some, uh, oftentimes, uh, ESY um, has some challenges during the summertime, and so with Neil's background, Mr. Evans's background as people services, it's been very helpful. Um, he has a whole new appreciation for riding a school bus with uh, ESY students. Uh, but all of that brings me to the, the point on the agenda, which is a proposal for transportation consulting services. Um, there is a company, uh, you know, Transportation um, Advisory Services is the name of the company, and we actually had them in a few years ago to help us write specifications. But in addition to writing specifications, they do several other functions. Um, and one of them, the first one that's in their proposal, which we had on the website, is to come in and study uh, and write and look at uh, efficiency studies for um, our transportation department. And it's, you know, that would be phase one. And they would do analysis of our expenses related to transportation. Um, and they would do some compare and contrast. But they would talk to people. They would interview people. And I think Mr. Stover would still be there so they'd have a chance to pick his brain as well, historically. Um, and then what you would like to do or what we would like to do is be able to take the information from the efficiency study and then begin use that as part of a um, you know perhaps discussion as we begin negotiating with the support staff for um, the next year because the contract ends on June 30th of 2018. Um, in their proposal they go right into uh, phase two uh, if it was if it becomes the board's uh, desire that we look at uh, perhaps writing RFPs and going out for bid on that phase or that operation, they would be available to go ahead and um, help us with that. Um, there is a timeline laid out. The methodology is also in there, but uh, the contract with TAS needs to be approved. Um, what I would recommend is that we approve the first section, the first uh, phase, if you will, and go through um, the data collection. And data collection is going to be really financial information, number of employees, what the wage rates are, looking at the contract. In our case, looking at the cost uh, related to the lease of the building. So there'll be a lot of info that needs to come out of the business office um, and, and runs and those type of things, looking at our PD uh, reports. And then um, that part is that the cost for that um, is $9,750. If we moved into phase two, 
which would be specifications um, and modifications and, and then looking at um, requests for proposals for outsourcing, um, then we would move into a whole new phase, which is over $12,000. Um, I want to call to your attention benefits. It's their intention to have this consulting arrangement would result in a detailed review of the current transportation program, recommendations for future operation of the program, whether in-house or contracted, an efficient bid process, if that's what's determined um, that needs to be done. So we continue to look at transportation, and I would recommend that we move this forward at least at least at this time only, if uh, that's what we want, uh, for payment of the $9,750 um, for phase one. Questions? Um, just reiterating, you said they would definitely also be looking at the lease of the garage. Did you say that? I, I did, but I don't want you to misunderstand. The lease of the garage is a big part of the right. expense. Right, okay. So they would be looking at that. and. If you go to their website, they they really do a lot of transportation across the United States into Canada as well. Um, and they wouldn't be looking at the lease per se, Mrs. Good. They would be looking at the costs associated with the lease. Okay. And how it fits in just to the the whole cost of everything. I, I mean, it, not only the cost, but the location. For example, I talked with Mr. Andrews. Um, and, he, and he kind of remembered the building because they were here before. And, he, and we might look at the lease and say, would there be some recommendations as to improvements in the area um, that would make it a better fit? Uh, perhaps talking with the, you know, the owner as far as moving forward with the lease. Um, so there's a lot of different things that could be discussed and looked at as we move on. As everyone knows, the lease is over $360,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Right. However, any place that we would park buses would be, or would buy, would be expensive as well. Right. Any other questions? Um, to do a project like this, um, this study would uh, provide us with uh, a list, I, I would imagine, of recommendations. Um, my thought is that as we know with, with our transportation system, and I guess any district's transportation system, we're not very nimble in the middle of the school year to implement changes. And I'm wondering if in phase one, if they come across a number of things that would be recommendations, uh, would we be able to implement it in such a way that we would know whether or not those recommendations are actually working? and I think we would want to incorporate experience of implementation into an RFP if we were deciding to go that way, but there's not time enough for all of that. And so I'm wondering how that might work. You know, going from phase one to phase two, you have a list of recommendations, but you really haven't tried them yet, and now you're trying to make a, an RFP based on the recommendations. I, th I think it will be become actually part of the negotiation process, or it certainly could be, because the recommendations that they're going to make will not really be so much on bus routes and those type of things. It would be how we would structure uh, our, our efficiencies that could be gained with the staff that we have. Um, you know, right now, all of our drivers run three different levels, high school, middle school, elementary. Um, maybe there would be something different with how they would recommend also even um, private and parochial. And while you say we're not very nimble, which is true, uh, I can tell you from experience that sometimes buildings open in the middle of the year, transportation routes change on winter break. So there is some fl flexibility and some things okay. that can happen. Um, one district in southeastern Pennsylvania recently had an uh, efficiency set study and um, it was favorably received, and there was no need to move forward with uh, writing an RFP. So um, we have to kind of wait and see. I, I understand your concern, but um, it's been difficult transportation okay, for the so last it's, six it's, years. 
a lot of the recommendations you're saying then are more like internal operations correct things as opposed to um, the external bus routes and pickups and all that sort of stuff yes so. because what really drives uh, the cost yeah. and, and efficiency if you will of transportation are a lot of the internal um, the contract uh, how we again how buses are utilized um, for not only for the th runs um, field trips um, athletic events all, all of those okay. type of um, private parochial schools alternative placements okay um, all right based on that um, what do you need from us this evening do you need uh, Approval to move forward to legislative for phase one is that the intent? due to the amount that's here yes for phase one um, but I would go ahead and probably ask that it be a ratification in August let them know that in, so that we can get on their list okay. and we can start sending them the information if we wait till August the 21st before we start sending information okay. it would okay. it, that's a little bit late and that would push back our, into our timeline uh, if we decide or if it was decided we wanted to do something more and move into phase two okay understood. Um, okay I, I, I support phase one and uh, I do too if I hear okay, thank no you. objections and uh, proceed forward okay thank you all right okay and then the second item is purchase of school buses joint services agreement with the school district of Springfield Township yes there has been an advertisement placed um, for buses again joint we did this last year it's a little bit later I'm sure you all remember that uh, we had new buses at the beginning of the year uh, we would be expecting a delivery in October November I'm thinking more November which is fine because they will give us a discount usually a reduced price and we're hoping to save enough money that we might be able to re replace a van uh, as well which are, the vans are becoming rather high mileage but the um, um, bid opening will be on August the 8th at 2 p.m. over at um, Springfield Township actually in the Transportation Center I've been there a number of times I probably will go um, and um, and if you want to look at the RFP and all of its various um, portions of it it's great reading if you have insomnia um, but anyway it, it's it's all on the Springfield website okay all right so we'll see how the bids mm -hmm. go and uh, and then you'll have something uh, for the board after that yes I hope to have that um, it would be too soon to bring it directly to the board I think on August the um, 21st so we'll probably look at it in operations and then move forward but if there's some if they come through with something that might be an incentive um, I might bring it for discussion on August oh, the sure. 21st right. okay. okay all right any questions on this item okay. all right then uh, I think that covers all of our uh, items uh, so now it's time for community input if anyone would like to address the committee please step to the podium state your name section of the township in which you live and four minute rules I know you're fact. shocked uh, Jen Kuznets Fort Washington um, just a couple follow-up questions even from the legislative meeting that I had um, the reason why I was asking about the Thomas Fitzwater vestibule thing is in one of the documents you the school district of Upper Dublin notes to basic financial statements fiscal year ending whatever page 53 under the Thomas Fitzwater Elementary School security vestibule it says the contract amount was eight hundred and sixty four thousand two hundred dollars that's I guess that's why I was just asking I, I was just kind of trying to inquire as to what that number meant or was um, so that's one question uh, if uh, if yeah. I could what page I think it sounds like a typo but I'll need to follow up on that okay what was um, the page number 53 53 Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and then I saw on the facilities plan or the update that Maple Glen's roof is leaking. Um, how old is the roof? And what's the cost when we do have to replace that? I think those are residential shingles. So 
typically that's what a 25, 30 year roof. I don't, how many years are we into that? Because um, it's already leaking. And so when we talk, I guess my point is when we talk about $70 million for a new middle school, I'm thinking we have a roof the size of Kentucky that's going to go in about 10 years or so. And we're, you know, in the middle of these big things. I know we couldn't afford to do the Fort Washington windows. So, you know, when I see the number on this, and I know it's 2014 when it says that everything can be fixed for 73 million, you know, it's kind of like, well, can we do four buildings for 70 million instead of just one? And I'm not saying that Sandy Run isn't challenged. I, that's, I guess, not my point. If, I feel like if we're going to go down the road and spend all this money, we should try to benefit the most kids and there are many more kids in the four elementary schools and there are, you know, um, it's across the district as opposed to just the middle school which has maybe 900 kids in it. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of the best way to, to spend the money if, if we're really set on spending it. Um, so that's a question. And then, hang bear with me while I kind of look through. Oh, um, one question I had is, who, when we did the high school construction project, I know Dewey Engineer kind of came in, maybe not in the beginning, we kinda, he was kind of brought in after the fact. Who was in charge of maybe picking some of these vendors that we did? For instance, we have all kinds of issues with the pools. Was it, is, is your engineer the person who helps you choose the best vendor or subcontractors or whatever you want to call them? I don't know the term if on a commercial level. Who helps you decide that? Because we've had problems in here that we've had to rip things out and replace. We've had like wood shop vans that aren't big enough and we've had to replace them. Just there's been all kinds of little things and I know, you know, things need to get fixed. We've had heating issues, water filter issues. I feel like we can never quite regulate the air in here. It's always too cold. Um, so I guess, you know, one of my questions is, Part of me believes or thinks or it seems like just from not knowing enough because I'm not behind the scenes that if we need to stay on budget, sure, we can stay on budget. But instead of getting A, we end up getting X because it fits in our numerical component. And so that's part of my concern when we talk about, you know, I know we can stay on the $70 million budget, but where, how do those cuts happen? And then do we end up having to pay more in the long run to fix them? Like, fixing the pool for the 14th time. Mm, I guess I'm out of time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple questions. Um, when, is, uh, phase, when will the phase one report be completed for the the bus transportation and it's a great list Bob it's a great list I, I understand everything on here pretty much um, a couple of things could have been maybe um, like a uh, an Eagle Scout project you know painting of the Ballards you know um, some of these some of these um, issues on here are pretty quick you know it could be a quick fix you know the fire extinguisher Instead of putting a blue, you know, put no signs and stick them, you know, as long as it's code, you know, you're good. But it's, it's a great list. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, we'll close community input and try to address uh, some of these items. Uh, the first had to do with uh, Thomas Fitzwater vestibule. Yes, do you have any information there? I'm looking at that, and I think that they called it Thomas Fitzwater, and it should have been uh, Capital Projects. They have GEM... They have earth movers in there from last year. That would have been Sandy Run Middle School. That was Sandy Run Middle School. Um, the road taking out and, right. and dealing with um, the tennis courts. I'm sorry. The bridge and, all that. and bridge. So that's where it's a combination. It should have just said capital projects across the top of that. But there were three, three different projects that were in there. Thank you, Bob, for remembering that. I was... I should have remembered, but I knew. That. And then there's gem, gem mechanical in there as, as something else as, as well. So um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'll let them know about it this year. I did not catch that in the footnote. Okay. Uh, the Maple Glen uh, roof shingles, yeah. uh, when are they due for roof? Yes, uh, they are a residential style, heavy residential style building. Uh, I believe we can get 10 more years 
out of the, the shingles themselves. When I got here, one of the contractors we've been using for roofing, uh, they've been solely uh, a commercial roofing outfit, more dealing with build-up roofs, not as much the residential. Uh, so I don't think leaks were handled as well as they should. We have turned to a, a residential contractor, and one of the things we looked at first was what thickness of the shingles left, how much wear do we have on the shingles, and the shingles have very little wear on them. We're seeing very little of the, uh, the asphalt pedals in the gutters or where we would expect to see it if they were deteriorating. Uh, what we found are the, the nails, so it's just simply the roofing nails are working their way back up and puncturing uh, the shingles. So the roof leaks that we've been finding uh, have been handled by the residential contractor uh, on our roof. Uh, right now, as far as I know, we have all the leaks stopped. I, I always expect additional leaks to pop up. Uh, but the shingles themselves, I believe we can get 10 more years out of on that school. They, they've um, been on the school since it was built. Since it was built, yes. Yeah, 2000. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're, so we're about 17 years in. We get yeah, another 10 years out of them. We're going to have repairs along the way. Uh, so it sounds like the name of the game is uh, just regular inspections to get up there before uh, the leaks uh, start to develop if you have some nails starting to pop. Right, and we're, we had some catch-up to do with this contractor. Uh, some of the problem uh, that we had is some of the leaks had, had warped the roof uh, boards. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have to replace any of the plywood, but uh, the roofer that we had was able to lift the shingles up, resecure the boards, and... Uh, and then resecure the shingles again. So you may have, uh, in the cases where a shingle has to be replaced, there might be a slight discoloration, uh, but the roof itself is is currently holding uh, the water out of the building. Okay, good. All right. Um, next was a, a question about uh, who picks the subcontractors uh, on a on a major project like at the high school or potential Sandy Run project. Uh, well, we were talking about PlanCon earlier, and so we're required to have form prime. Um, bids you know, plumbing hvac general and electrical electrical, electrical thank you um and really it depends upon which contractor um, that you select they are permitted to have um, the subs and now they the subcontractors have been working with the um, prime contractor in order to build you know submit um prices and cost so that then the um contractor that they're bidding to, one of the four primes, will have the numbers um, that will be able to um, be accumulated and opened on that day of bid opening. But one of the things I think we all have to remember about the pool, we've had issues with that. We have had HVAC and, and, and other issues. We spent a, a lot of money. Is that all of those items receive a great deal of use. And so I'm not making excuses but if you use things a lot, 24-7, 365, or very close to it, and our pool is closed, I'm, I, I think, less than three weeks for the entire year, um, you're going to have, things are going to wear out. Um, and we are, I mean, we've talked about it here uh, at our other meetings, even though it's the newest building in Upper Dublin, we're going to start to have, see more um, repairs and maintenance as we move forward. How many heat pumps do we have in this building? 483 or something like that? Three to 400 heat pumps in the building. Uh, so we do have a, a large amount of equipment. We also have complex equipment. Uh, nothing here is a, um, as simple as it used to be. It's, uh, you know, the efficiency is greatly improved, but so has the, uh, so has the complexity of the equipment to, to make it more efficient. If there's a, uh, a hypothetical subcontractor that we've had a very negative experience with, is there the means uh, within putting the bid documents together to um, suggest that uh, that particular subcontractor should not be part of uh, the bidding process? I don't know that I've ever seen trying to go down to a subcontract level. Certainly, um, there's... If, if you're trying not to deal with a, a prime contractor, oftentimes you are able to um, um, finesse or put together your specifications a little more carefully. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my experience. Bob, you have more than what I have. No, not uh, on public bidding. Never no. been able to. Okay. Unless, uh, unless somebody just 
uh, didn't meet the requirements uh, that you had picked would be the only way to not allow a sub. So it would be it would be a matter of the uh, um, construction manager to to really um, hone in on performance, and if there was a, a lacking uh, performance level from a certain sub, then I imagine some pressure could come to bear to uh, get that person off the job. Uh, yes, or at least at the very minimum to step up and perform. And I can tell you when the high school was being built that there were a few of those. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. Uh, and then I guess Stan was asking about the phase one report, when that might be available. Just as an aside, I noticed in the methodology document there, they do say that they will come back and kind of review and present how their recommendations have impacted how things are going. And I assume that's before you have to go into phase two. It's going to be pretty close, but so yes, I think that's the, that's it doesn't the give idea. give you a time frame per se, but I would assume that they can turn around anyway the results. Quickly. Review. Yeah. And before you have to decide about going into phase two. So it, it is on the website, and what it says, on-site visit and recommendations is in October. Right. So okay. that's what we'll need to move toward. And, and, as I, and again, I wanted to check with uh, Mr. Andrews today just to be certain that, it, again, it's July 20th. If we give him the go sign, can we still meet all of those deadlines and those benchmarks that he laid out? And he assured me today that they could. And Stan also brought up, uh, you know, uh, just uh, honing in on the quick fixes whenever possible, which I know you, you've been been all over that with with your crews and that. And uh, again, we really appreciate the work that you and your crews are doing. If there are opportunities for Eagle Scouts to come in or whatever, <laughs> uh, keep that in mind. But um, but generally, probably. <laughs> but it, it's been a major change. Uh, what we saw with uh, some of the. Uh, uh, the entranceway uh, windows and things like that, the carpentry that was, was done, uh, I hadn't seen before in the district. So uh, you guys are doing a great job, and, and we really appreciate it. I'll pass that along to them. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. I think that covers everything that we talked about in, uh, in the community input. Um, any other comments or questions from the board? We're from the administration. All right, then. Uh, our next. Uh, I'll find it, am I? There it is. Our next uh, meeting of the Operations Committee will be on August the 24th, 6 o'clock, uh, right here in the beautiful Upper Dublin High School Cardinal Room. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening, and have a good evening.